If you watch the first part of this lecture on human nature, you now have a good gut feel about the nature aspects of the debate. In this, the second part, we will be looking at the nurture aspects of human nature. The main area of investigation being the philosophies on which we base our understanding of ourselves and our reality. We will look at the nature of philosophy, how old this debate is, spiritual development, progressive thinkers, conservative thoughts, modern conservative thinkers, and scientific thoughts. Philosophy is a very subjective issue. There are a lot of differing philosophies. The Romantic philosophy says that we are born innocent and good, but society corrupts us. The existentialists and postmodernists say that we are born a blank slate. Existentialists believe that we decide what we want to be, while the postmodernists say that human nature does not exist at all, and that our individual identities are formed by the societies that we live in. Conservatives believe that we are born who we are, we have a predisposition to be bad, but that we want to do good. Where do these ideas come from? Philosophies are the models by which we try to understand the world. They are a product of the conscious white brain that we spoke about earlier. The word philosophy comes from ancient Greece, the word philosophia, which is the love of wisdom. To philosophize means to speculate or theorize about fundamental or serious issues. We develop philosophies as models for our understanding of reality, what is, and who we are, and why. And of course, where are we going? There are a number of core areas of philosophy. Metaphysics, the nature of being and of God. Epistemology, the nature of knowledge. Logic, the rule of reason. Aesthetics, the understanding of beauty. Ethics, code of conduct. And politics, how best do we govern? Moral philosophy is concerned primarily with the question of the best way to live and secondarily concerning the question of whether this question can be answered. Political philosophy is the study of government and the relationship of individuals to communities including the state. Politics and ethics are traditionally interlinked subjects as both discuss the question what is good and how should people live? There are two problems that I have with philosophy. The first one being similar to the story of the blind men and an elephant. I'll tell you the original version which came from the Buddhist canon. A number of disciples went to see the Buddha and said, Sir, there are living here in Savati many wandering hermits and scholars who indulge in constant dispute, some saying that the world is infinite and eternal, and others that it is finite and not eternal. Some say that the soul dies with the body, and others say that it lives on forever, and so forth. What, sir, would you say concerning them? The Buddha answered, Once upon a time there was a certain Raja who called to his servant and said, Come, good fellow, go and gather together in one place all the men of Savati, who were born blind, and show them an elephant. Very good, sire, replied the servant, and he did as he was told. He said to the blind men assembled here, Here is an elephant. And to one man he presented the head of the elephant, to another its ears, to another a tusk, to another the trunk, the foot, back, tail, and tuft of the tail, saying to each one that that was the elephant. When the blind men had felt the elephant, the Raja went to each one of them and said to each, Well, blind man, have you seen the elephant? Tell me, what sort of a thing is this elephant? Thereupon, the men who were presented with the head answered, Sire, the elephant is like a pot. And the men who had observed the ear replied, An elephant is like a winnowing basket. Those who were presented with a tusk said that it was a plowshare. Those who knew only the trunk said that it was a plow. Others said the body was a granary, the foot a pillar, the back a mortar, the tail a pestle, 
the tuft of the tail a brush. Then they began to quarrel, shouting, Yes, it is. No, it is not. An elephant is not that. Yes, it's like this or that and so on, till they came to blows over the matter. Brethren, the Raja was delighted with the scene. Just so are these preachers and scholars holding various views, blind and unseeing. In their ignorance, they are by nature quarrelsome and wrangling, each maintaining reality is thus and thus. Then the exalted one rendered this meaning by uttering this verse of uplift. Oh, how they cling and wrangle, some who claim, for preacher and monk the honored name. For quarreling each to his view they cling, such folk see only one side of a thing. The parable implies that one's subjective experience can be true, but that such experience is inherently limited by its failure to account for other truths or a totality of truth. In the same way, in philosophy, we are limited by when we live and where we live. Hobbes was affected by the horrors of the English Civil War, while Rousseau was affected by the terrible inequalities of aristocratic France. Each one of these philosophers saw one aspect of the world. These experiences were then colored by individual values. So, each philosophy has some truth to it, but not one is totally true. The second problem stems from the fact that new philosophies are usually developed as a reaction to some old state that has become stagnant and unfair. We see arguments against the old and in support of the ideal new. Unfortunately, once the old is overthrown, everything is thrown out. The new goes too far in some direction. And then other people think that the new philosophy is unfair. And so there's a backlash or a counter revolution, which then again goes too far in the other direction. Let's look at a timeline of thought. The Middle Ages, from about 500 to 1500 AD, in European history, were characterized by conformism. It was a time of fear and superstition. People thought that life was supposed to be hard. They grew up thinking that life was nothing but hard work and war. The Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church, was the center of every part of life. People began to feel more and more oppressed by the Roman Catholic Church's emphasis on secular activities rather than having a focus on the spiritual well-being of its members. Then came the Renaissance and a new way of thinking. Now people thought that life could be enjoyable and that they could have comforts. They started to think that people should be educated and that things like art, music and science could make life better for everyone. The individualism of the Renaissance era encouraged people to boldly challenge the authority of the Roman Catholic Church as a world power. Humanism taught people to think as individuals and promoted the idea that humans, not supernatural forces, controlled history. On October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses onto the huge wooden doors of the church in Wittenberg, Germany. The rise of secularism in Europe started. The scientific revolution which started in 1543 led to the start, in 1685, the Age of Enlightenment, or the Age of Reason. The Enlightenment was a cultural movement of intellectuals emphasizing reason and individualism over tradition and faith. Enlightenment thinkers opposed superstition and intolerance. The Enlightenment was based on the empiricism of the scientific method, a theory which states that knowledge comes only, or primarily, from sensory experience. The Enlightenment, they felt, was simply freedom to use one's own intelligence. The philosophers of the Enlightenment attacked the Church because it blocked human reason. The Romantics soon attacked the Enlightenment because they felt that it blocked the free play of the emotions and the creativity. To some, the age of reason became too mechanical. Man became a soulless thinking machine, a robot. 
For the romantic, the result was nothing less than the demotion of the individual, imagination, sensitivity, feelings, spontaneity, and freedom, all stifled, choked to death. Man must liberate himself from these intellectual chains they felt. For Jean-Jacques Rousseau, father of the French Revolution and also father of counter-enlightenment for some, the age of reason turned into an age of reflection, with emphasis on emotion, a shift from the objective to the subjective. Rousseau, along with the Romantics that followed him, argued that the Enlightenment was reductionist, insofar that it, it had largely ignored the forces of imagination, mystery, and sentiment. Some notable philosophers from this era that you can investigate further include Rousseau, Locke, and Hobbes. All of them believed in some form of social contract theory, which is an agreement entered into by individuals that results in the formation of the state or of organized society. The prime motive being the desire for protection, which entails a surrender of some or all personal liberty. Thomas Hobbes, after witnessing the horrors of the English Civil War, had a rather negative view of mankind. He felt that man was by nature bad and needs to be controlled by a strong government. He felt that the best government was an absolute authority like a monarchy, but a, but a benevolent monarchy under which citizens had rights. Jean-Jacques Rousseau was influenced by the inequalities of pre-revolution France, and his writings have him named as the father of the French Revolution. He felt that man is born good, but amoral, and that society corrupts and private property exploits the poor. It is up to society to combat inequality, and for this, a strong government, a dictatorship of the general will, was required to create a better society. John Locke, the father of classical liberalism, stood somewhere between these two philosophies. Then things started to get really strange with the existentialists. Kant proposed a theory of transcendental idealism, which said that we do not directly see things in themselves, we only understand the world through our human point of view. Hegel advocated a kind of historically minded absolute idealism in which the universe would realize its spiritual potential through the development of human society and in which the mind and nature can be seen as two abstractions of one indivisible whole spirit. And after them came the postmodernists that denied the existence of everything. The ideas just got crazier and crazier. On the foundations of the Romantics, the existentialists and postmodernists came progressive ideas like those of Fabian socialist George Bernard Shaw, who was of the opinion that some people see things as they are and ask why. I dream things that never were and ask why not. There is nothing that can be changed more completely than human nature when the job is taken in hand early enough. And then came the progressive revolutionaries that didn't want to just change the world, but they wanted to change mankind as well. They had a vision of a new man. Marxists believe that human nature is mainly created by social relations. Humans are therefore capable of making or shaping their own nature. Vladimir Stalin, Mao Zedong, Che Guevara, they all believe that the new man will be created as a result of the ideal social conditions of pure communism. Jean-Paul Sartre, an existentialist, said, Hell is other people. According to Sartre, the individual can shape his own life and defy its so-called nature. The individual makes decisions and bears the responsibility for its actions alone. The individual is free, as Sartre says, radically free. Well, why would we consciously choose to be bad so that we create a mutual hell that we all must live in? I don't understand. And for postmodernists, what in society creates bad people who then create hell out of society? 
Progressive logic on human nature confuses me. Based on romantic, existential, and postmodernist theory, they believe that man is, by nature, born good, and that society corrupts man. If society is a collection of men, and all men are born good, then what in society corrupts people? Maybe the answer comes from Emil Durkheim, who formally established the academic discipline of social science. With Karl Marx and Max Weber, Durkheim is commonly cited as the principal architect of modern social science and father of sociology. He said that society is a sui generi reality, a reality unique to itself and irreducible to its composing parts, of its own kind, genus, and hence unique in its own characteristics, not the product of conscious intentions. Durkheim was of the opinion that this society entity uh, was created when individual consciences interacted, that they fused together to create a synthetic reality, something completely new, something greater than the sum of its parts. It should be noted also that Durkheim was against utilitarian individualism, which he described uh, where people pursued individual self-interest with the common good being enhanced by some sort of invisible hand. Durkheim did support what he called communal individualism, which supports dignity and liberty of the individual, but does not put self-interest first. The individual sacrifices for society. Now we start to see where these ideas came from. Professor Fred Miller said that collectivism treats society as if it were a superorganism existing over and above its individual members, and which takes the collective, in some form, to be the primary unit of reality and the standard of value. Hegel and Karl Marx both viewed political phenomenon as the inevitable result of historical processes and regarded collectives as of greater reality and value than their individual members. It's about time that somebody develop a philosophy of common sense. I live in a world which isn't black and white. My world is gray. For that reason, I want a philosophy of common sense. For me, the ideal blend is reason tempered by emotion. Common sense, like that of Abraham Lincoln, who said, human action can be modified to some extent, but human nature cannot be changed. Enough with the philosophy. Let's investigate religion. Religion might not be important to some, but consider what Benjamin Franklin wrote. If men are so wicked as we now see them with religion, what would they be if without it? If human nature is good, if man is born good, would we need almost 3,000 years of spiritual and religious guidance to teach us how to be better people? Would we need the Ten Commandments? The logical conclusion is that there is something inherently flawed or selfish or bad in our human nature. I'm a Catholic. One of the core tenets of my religion from the first pages of the Old Testament, roots of Judaism and Islam, is that I am born with an original sin. To be honest, I think the whole Adam and Eve story is just a metaphor, but it does touch on the fact that we are born with a flaw. 2,600 years ago in Persia, Zarathustra, father of the first monotheistic religion, Zoroastrianism, said that humans are essentially good, but that there is a struggle in our nature between the angelic higher self and the lower animal self. The human condition is the mental struggle between the truth, the divine order, and the lie, ignorance and chaos. A hundred years later in China, Confucius did not have an opinion on whether man was inherently good or bad, but he did say that by nature, men are similar, but by practice, they are wide apart. Confucius must have perceived all men to be born with intrinsic similarities, 
but that man is conditioned and influenced by study and practice. His disciples did, though, debate human nature. Mencius was of the opinion that man is basically good, while Zunzi felt that man is by nature evil. Zunzi said, A person is born with a liking for profit, and a person is born with feelings of envy and hate. If he gives way to them, they will lead him to violence and crime, and any sense of loyalty and good faith will be abandoned. There is a commonality shared by virtually all of the world's religions. The concept is called the golden rule. Do to others what you would want them to do to you. A very positive guideline for life. The core of everything is how we treat our fellow man. Confucius said that the idea of reciprocity was the one word that can guide us in life. Buddhism tells us not to hurt others in ways that we would find harmful. In Judaism, Hillel the Elder said, That which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. That is the whole Torah. The rest is the explanation. Go and learn. Now let's fast forward to modern times and modern thoughts on human nature. New ideas based on modern science. Today we know a lot more about human psychology, anthropology, and sociology, and so I would have more faith uh, in modern thought than the speculations they had 250 years ago. Abraham Maslow, the psychologist that gave us Maslow's hierarchy of needs, said in 1956, Human nature is essentially biologically driven. It is unchangeable or unchanging. Our inner nature is in part unique to the individual and in part species-wide. This is very similar to what Jung said. It seems not to be intrinsically or primarily or necessarily evil. It is weak, delicate, and subtle, easily overcome by habit and cultural pressure. Even though it is weak, it rarely disappears. We must develop our ability to control and to delay our impulses so that we can guide our life to grow healthy, fruitful, and happy. If this essential core is denied or suppressed, a person will get sick. In the 1990s, social psychologist Jonathan Haidt developed the social intuitionist model of moral judgment. The model posits that moral judgment is mostly based on automatic processes, moral intuitions, rather than on conscious reasoning. Starting in 2004, Haight and Craig Joseph proposed the moral foundations theory, building on the ideas of social intuitionism and on the work of cultural anthropologist Richard Sweater. The Moral Foundations Theory was popularized in Haight's 2012 book, The Righteous Mind. Based on intuitive ethics stemming from the process of human evolution, the social psychological theory explains the origins of and variation in human moral reasoning on the basis of innate foundations. Moral Foundations Theory shows how inherently different conservatives and progressives are. While conservatives place equal importance on all elements, progressives tend to place greater emphasis on fairness and care. Russell Kirk, a great American conservative philosopher and author of The Conservative Mind, put forth the Ten Conservative Principles. In principle number six, he says, Conservatives are chastened by the principle of imperfectibility, which means... Human nature suffers irremediably from certain grave faults. Man being imperfect, no perfect social order can ever be created. Many modern conservative thinkers speak about the conflict in thinking about human nature. Larry Arnhart speaks of the realist versus utopian vision. Thomas Sowell speaks of the constrained versus unconstrained. Steven Pinker speaks of the tragic versus utopian. Realist 
constrained, tragic, these all mean that human nature is flawed in some way. In Arnhardt's realist vision, moral and intellectual limits of human beings are rooted in their unchanging human nature. A good social order has to make the best of these natural limitations rather than trying to change them. In Thomas Sowell's constrained vision, humans are inherently limited in knowledge, wisdom, and virtue, and all social arrangements must acknowledge those limits. Human nature is unchanging, and man is naturally, inherently self-interested, regardless of the best intentions. In Pinker's tragic vision, human nature is limited in virtue and knowledge, and these limits constrain what we can do in our social arrangements. This leads us to respect those traditional practices that have been tested by experience, even though they were not rationally designed. And this concludes 500 years of thought. We've covered the concept of philosophy, timeline of thought, key philosophers, religion, modern psychology, and modern conservative thinkers. Is that enough to think about? My conclusion is that I don't think that there's a struggle between good and evil inside of me, but that there is a struggle between my inner caveman and the modern man that I am expected to be. Some things that you should uh, think about for yourself. Good and evil are subjective terms. Does good equal altruistic? Does bad equal selfish? And who decides how much altruism is good and how much selfishness is bad? Do we have an innate human nature? I don't know what the answer to that is, but my gut feel tells me that there is. Here's what I see in myself. I don't see a blank slate. A blank slate absolves people of personal responsibility. As far back as I can remember, there was something inside of me, guiding me, making me into who I am, my strengths, my weaknesses. I see a man with passions, strengths, and weaknesses. I have thoughts, and I do not know where they come from. I feel that I'm 10% bad and 90% good, if I have to quantify it. The bad, at times, is powerful and appealing, confusing emotions that cause me to do either the wrong thing that I will later regret, or help me fight tirelessly to do the right thing. If we have to pick one of the three philosophies, that man is bad but wants to be good, man is good but society makes him bad, or that man is what society makes him, I prefer the concept that man is bad but wants to be good. Not solely because of what human nature might be, but because I think the social models that flow from this philosophy can do far less harm than can the solutions brought by utopian ideals and agendas that are based on man being either inherently good or a blank slate. The last thing that I want is a society where social engineers with an agenda are creating the new man. While the utopian aspirations of the romantics, the existentialists, and the postmodernists sound like they are being done for the right reasons, good reasons, we must not forget that the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and that the devil is in the details. The devil is in the details of the roadmap that an imperfect man tries to build for a complex system such as society. Even if we know where we want to go, we don't know who we are. And if we don't know who we are today, how do we develop a roadmap to get somewhere? I don't believe in Hegel, Marx, or Durkheim. I'm a conservative, and we believe that human nature does exist. It's not perfect. It is permanent and universal. It is not malleable. Well, maybe it is a little bit. We believe that we are bad, whatever that subjective term means, but that we can be good, and we want to be good. Social influences 
help us do the right thing. We prefer slow evolution to rapid change. We need proof that something will work. Yes, we are risk averse because once institutions are destroyed, it's hard to rebuild them. We believe that we are all unique and that we want to protect our differences. How can we be unique and all be equal? Think about it. Liberty is important so that we can reach our full potential, our self-actualization. As we've seen, there are a lot of theories about human nature, most of them conflicting with one another. We can choose to believe what we want to believe, and we justify what we see in ourselves. The debate will go on for a long time. So I believe what I want to believe, and you believe what you want to believe. And I want you to believe what you believe, and let us debate. The progressives will believe what they want to believe, and that is their nature and that is their right. To be honest, I think we need them to help keep ourselves balanced. The key is that all we need to do is ensure that we can convince 51% of the voters to believe in our conservative vision and to keep the social engineers out of power. That is the greatest goal. Keep the progressive social engineers out of power. And this concludes the lecture on human nature, the first part in the Conservative Fundamentals video lecture series. The next lecture will be a look at good versus bad. What is it and who defines it?